Welcome back to ShiftCast. We've got episode 20, and it is a special episode. We have a legend in the Rocket League esports space. CloudFuel is joining us. CloudFuel, CloudFuel, thank you for making some time for us tonight. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Uh, definitely appreciate you guys reaching out. Excited to uh, chat with y'all. Yeah, yeah, super excited. So we've got um, we've got some stuff here that we want to talk about. We're going to hand the, the mic over to Yens for now, and he's going to lead the way. Obviously, Michael and I will chime in when we have some questions or, or some things that we want to add in. But Yens, the floor is yours. Take it away. Yeah, I mean, I'm just excited to talk to Cloudfield because yeah. I have been watching RLCS, well, let's say Rocket League Esports, since um, I would say the RLC Grand Finals is the, the first thing that I remember. Um, like just before season one of the RLCS. And th that's the first thing I watched back on YouTube in the in the VOD. And then RLCS came around and I started following more closely. And I was there in Amsterdam for season two. But you, Cloudfuel, have been instrumental in making it all happen, right? Because you were one of the people who actually came into the Rocket League scene not knowing about its predecessor, Supersonic Acrobatic Rocket Power Battle Cars. And just. More time? Supersonic yeah, Acrobatic Rocket Power Battle Cars, actually. <laughs> Pretty good, actually. <laughs> and you just flew in organizing tournaments left and right and helping everyone organizing tournaments, so much so that it landed you a job with Twitch. Is, is that the first thing that you started off with? Am I right? Yeah, I mean, that was like the first. I guess like official professional kind of gig that I got. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was definitely a whirlwind for me. Like it's it's weird for me to kind of hear you kind of like repeat it back to me because like in the moment as I was doing all that stuff, it was it was yeah. very much just like go with the flow as I'm talking to players. Like I remember talking to like Cronovi back before he yeah. was the Cronovi. Um, Steve Bills. Yeah, yeah, it was Steve Bills at the time, and like just he hearing was. him talk about you know how much. The community and it was a very small tight-knit community at the time how much they wanted to like eventually become an esport and i'm like i'm playing in games with these guys watching them do all these crazy aerials and stuff and i'm like how is this not an esport already right this should just be out there already and so i just started doing what i knew how to do which was run events to be fair i was not very good at it i just had been doing it a little bit so i think i had a little bit of a leg up there and you know i i just try to help where I could. And it, it just kind of started snowballing and it's, it's still kind of wild to me to see where it's gone from there. Um, but it is, you know, it, it's cool that you mentioned that uh, the RLC pro league grand finals was like the first thing you saw, because that was the moment I think collectively everybody in the community was like, okay, this, this can yeah. be something. We had like 10,000 people watching and everybody was on the edge of their seats. Like psionics was there. Everyone was there. It was such a cool yeah. moment. And yeah, I think that was like the moment where everyone was like, okay, we can do this. Like, let's make this a real thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it started off so quickly, right? It started snowballing so quickly because it started in 2015, 2016, eventually when RLCS came around, which is quite a bit later than a lot of the big esports that we have today, like Counter-Strike, League of Legends, whatever. So it kind of makes sense to me that it started off that quickly because there was some precedent for big esports leagues, but it it's still it's still incredible to look back and see how fast it grew in terms of viewership, in terms of prize money, because it went from if, if you had a tournament with fifteen hundred dollars on the line total, that was wow, okay, we've got something to play for. And then all of a sudden you're talking about a quarter of a million, million, two million. Yeah, and it's interesting because at the same time, Overwatch was becoming a thing, same year. Uh, Rainbow Six was also becoming big. And like it was interesting, it's interesting like looking back now at how those developers approach their games versus how Sionics kind of approached Rocket League. They it it felt like to me, at least, kind of from the outside and, and even kind of chatting with them as we got to work together, it felt like an overnight success. Right. Because yeah. I remember when Dave, you know, had the sort of infamous line of like, all right, I'll, I'll eat a bunch of bread if, you know, if we end up breaking more than 10K. And it was it was well, well over that. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of seeing like how they they put so much focus into the community at first and kind of left the community to figure out the esports stuff on their own. 
And some might say like, oh, okay, well, maybe they should have been more involved. But I'm actually really glad that it worked out the way it did because I think it allowed us as a community to show a hunger for it. And it also allowed for people like myself to kind of get, you know, my feet wet with tournament organization experience. You know, it allowed for people like James Bot to get his kind of like casting teeth and, you know, just kind of like figuring stuff out as we go. And, and so like it was interesting to watch, you know, like you said, the progression of it going from very community based where, yeah, I mean, the first events that I ran were, I, I think it was like a hundred bucks or something. And then it was like 500 bucks and then a thousand. And then RLC Pro League, I think, capped out around 5K, which at the time was like incredible. It was unheard of. And then all of a sudden the RLCS comes around and now we're talking 75 K and it just keeps exponentially growing from there. So it's, yeah, yeah. it definitely started very quickly. It, like, especially looking back now over the what, eight years or so, it definitely started very quickly. Yeah. yeah it's, it's very funny to listen back to interviews with you from those times where you were, <laughs> you were talking about how there were players who were actually getting paid when they were assigned to an organization. That was a first back then, and yeah. how that that, that was uh, I by Power was the first organization to do that, and right. then SK Gaming came in and Complexity showed some interest. So Flips it all tactics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It all went very very quickly from there, and during those first seasons of RCS, you started off with a system with two splits in the first season, and at the time you said that was because you only had some small tournaments running before that. So you didn't actually know if those players participating in those tournaments with only maybe a couple of hundred teams signing up were actually the best players in the world, right? So to be sure, you actually had a system in place with multiple qualifiers, if you can call them that, um, to, to figure out who the best Rocket League players in the world were when the game was just launching, basically, right? We're talking about the first year after launch. How do you look, look back on that now? Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely an interesting time because I think Twitch and so I don't know how much people know this, but like Twitch and Psionics came together at the beginning of 2016 to form like a partnership to make the RLCS. And that's how I got involved. Twitch hired me um, as somebody who like had a background and like professional stuff outside of esports, but then also was starting to do esports stuff. And so I came in to help them uh, help help them along with Psionics to run the whole thing. And like the vision that we had, you know, it's interesting kind of looking back now and seeing where things have kind of changed over the years. But the vision then was like Psionics really wanted to have opportunities, a lot of opportunities for um, up and coming players to prove themselves. But we also wanted to have sort of this like I guess you could call it like a safety net or something where like there is an opportunity for those that have proven themselves to then be kind of propped up similar to what you see in like pro sports where, you know, once you get drafted in or you get, you know, brought onto a team, you're there for a while, right? Unless you prove yourself, you know, unworthy or whatever, but you're there for a while, you're in the spotlight and it allows you to grow a name for yourself. It allows the fans to get to know you. It creates this longevity and this continuity that, is hard to do when it's just all open qualifiers. So we were trying to balance the two out. And, you know, admittedly, the first season, it had its flaws. You know, the split system was something we kind of borrowed from League of Legends. We did like a, a you know, a sort of a, a watered down version of that, if you will. Um, and like it worked to a certain degree, but it was, yeah, I mean, we didn't really know what, what exactly we had in our hands. We knew, yeah, someone like Kronovi is probably going to be one of the best players. But beyond that, it was like we kind of needed to let everybody prove it right and i yeah. remember that first weekend that we we did the uh, first qualifier i got like two hours of sleep that weekend it was so crazy we were all like holed up at uh you know back then it was like nge studios or uh they eventually became a part of esports engine but yeah it was it was nge studios back then we were working with them to to do the broadcast and like the casters were there uh you know like josh and luke from psionics were there all of my folks from twitch were there um, and yeah, we were just like making that work and it, you know, it was on fire. Like if you look back at the forums and like the subreddit threads and stuff, it's, it was a crazy, crazy time. Uh, we did not expect anywhere close to that many players to sign up and to participate. So we were working with like a somewhat new system with smash GG. Like they had built that for smash for live events, this being an online event. 
it just meant, you know, there was so many more things you had to consider. And so, yeah, we, we really had to like kind of go through the fire and back to like figure out how to make this thing work. Um, and yeah, it's just interesting now to kind of look back at that and see the numbers in that first season, like 75 K wasn't really that much, but at the time and with all of the just forward momentum of, of rocket league, it was so huge. Yeah. I mean, everything was new to everyone, right? You had you coming in with before that, not that much experience in tournament organizer. You were thrown in the deep as well. You came, I think from energy logistics in the energy industry and yeah, then suddenly I was, yeah i was yeah. doing like logistics and customer service and like i i could kind of like you know use that to piece things together but there was right. so much that just yeah you, yeah. you have to like it, there's so much like on the fly type stuff you have to deal with like players not showing up when they're supposed to show up or players actually jo accidentally join the match when they're not supposed to ping issue there's just so many little things that i mean nothing has changed really yeah <laughs> and you just kind of have to be able to deal with it on the fly so it's yeah it, it was a very interesting time for sure and and the first lan as well right was in a nightclub yeah in yeah. los angeles <laughs> yeah oh, did you have to rearrange the entire nightclub twice for for both nights we did and we had to clean the floors because it was so sticky because people <laughs> had like alcohol uh. the night before it was it was gross um but it was also oh, no. really fun it was like a very it was a very intimate thing like you really had to be there because that was the first time a lot of these players got to meet each other and i remember just being like like we flew scrub killer in he wasn't even part of the rlcs and we we're just like dude you're gonna be a part of the rlcs someday let's just get you over here um and, and it was just it was just such a cool time getting to see everybody who had known each other online since you know they were kids getting to meet each other for the first time. And um, yeah, there was just something really special about that. Uh, again, like it, it couldn't work nowadays. It had to be like that, perf that perfect moment um, that early on in the, in the sort of life of, of RLE sports. Um, but yeah, it, it was a, uh, it was a really cool experience. Yeah. Well, then we got to season two and that's basically the reason why we've brought you on to Shiftcast today. We've got league play. Oh yeah. And now we've got be bringing lead play back with the shift summer league, and I know it's much smaller in in all aspects, but uh, we've obviously taken a lot of inspiration from your work back in the day, 2016. Yeah, when I saw that announcement, I was floored. I love that. Uh, it's it's something like I've I've talked, you know, I still keep in touch with a lot of the guys, um, but I, we've talked a lot about it. it's like you know, there's a lot of cool you know there's pros and cons to both systems, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on right now. But there is just something that's like really special about league play and being able to know like, all right, these are the teams that are in it. Who's going to come out on top? Let's see. And you watch it over the course of several weeks. That progression, it's just such a cool thing. So I'm, I'm super excited to see, you know, what you guys bring to the table with that and how it all kind of pans out. Yeah, well, we're completely new. We have some support, uh, fortunately, but uh, yeah, we're completely new to, to this as well. So. What are some of the challenges that you experienced when it all was new to you? Yeah, um, well, definitely scheduling, a huge part of it. Uh, not only scheduling around everybody's individual schedules and teams and whatnot, but also making sure that the season is interesting, right? That was mm -hmm. something I spent a lot of time, um, like DM Rawlings was our statistician back then. I worked with him and some other folks to like, try to figure out what matchups are going to be the most important at what time. Um, and if you look at, you know, pro sports, the way they do it, it's pretty smart. They leave some blinks in the calendar so they can put in marquee matchups, depending on how folks are doing within the season. We didn't really have that luxury. We had to build the schedule from day one. So we kind of had to predict like, all right, who's going to be the best? How do we save that match? So it's not the first match, but at the same time, we don't want the first, week to just be blowouts like so you kind of have yeah. to predict a little bit and of course things never go according to plan right uh who, who expected i buy power to not do so well right off the bat and then have this crazy comeback like it just you know whatever uh you can never predict these things but um yeah so there's a lot of that kind of scheduling stuff that goes in you also have to make it to where every team is still in it realistically at the end because you don't really want a team getting knocked theoretically out halfway through and then they've got nothing left to play for like we didn't have the promotion relegation system back then so you really wanted to make sure the matches meant something going all the way in um 
we ran into issues where, you know, if you had a certain match play before another one, then another team could theoretically throw if they wanted to. And that's never good. So you've got to like balance that stuff out. So definitely scheduling is a huge thing. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's just a matter of like making sure everybody understands what the expectations are. So like, Hey, you're going to play for this amount of time. You're going to have to be waiting for the previous match to get finished. It may or may not get done early. And if it does, you've got to be ready to go. And that's, it's difficult because as a player, you want to practice and be as warm as you can be before you get into a match, but the broadcast has to keep going. So that you've just oh, yeah. got to like balance those things out. And, you know, back then the players were so young and so new to this stuff that like there was no precedent of esport really within Rocket League. All they could look at is like, you know, like CS and League of Legends, things that you mentioned. But, you know, it, it's hard to like compare those things directly. So I think now there's been enough time that, you know, yeah, there's newer players that have come in, but there's been a precedent. People kind of know what to expect. They're, you know, they're coming in and they're playing with older players that have been around the block a bit. So I think it'll be a lot easier for you guys to, to kind of take the template that we put together and, hey, add some new twists to it to make it uh, ready for 2024. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we're getting we're getting some experienced admins and casters, and all that helps, of course, with making it uh, hopefully a, a great success. But yeah, it's going to be a much smaller version of whatever uh, the RCS was back in the day. But, but even season two, I mean, it was not nearly grown to how large it got within the time frame that you were working on as well, right? How was it, and, and what were the biggest challenges of? of how rapidly popular the esports got and with so many more teams and events. Yeah, it became really difficult to keep the system that we had in place because we needed more opportunity because it was very quickly becoming apparent that there were up and coming teams that could could challenge the top teams, right? Because at first at the first season, yeah. it was pretty clear like there was a top threshold and then there was kind of like this bubble group that was kind of small. And then there was everybody else. Yeah. But by the time you got around to like season three, season four, that bubble was huge. And I remember so many players pushing for some sort of like bubble league, which is kind of how the RLRS came around. Um, you know, having having two leagues kind of running concurrently was very tricky. Um, and it was meant to be like a way for us to, to kind of like almost have like a minor league system that could go into the RLCS, but there was also like, we didn't want them to be considered anything but equal. So it was, it was a weird sort of way to, to frame it. Um, but essentially it was like trying to, to find a way to give those aspiring players who were basically good enough. They just didn't have the consistency, um, give them a way to like get into the RLCS. And, and the way we had done it before was with the qualifiers, but I mean, as you saw, in fact, I think you guys just wrote an article, which I, I think is great. Uh, Team Iris, right? Everybody yep. thought that Iris was, was like the next, they were the, the next coming of like the best team. And it just didn't work. And it's like, looking back now, I still, that that's one that I'm like, man, I really wish things would have went differently. Uh, I wish that we would have had more opportunities for teams to make it through. I think it was a little... I think it was a lot harder. And I think that's the difficulty with league play versus what, what we're seeing now is like, again, pros and cons. Like I would say that this current system, maybe there's a little, you need a little bit more of the league play type stuff on top of it. You need a little bit more auto qualifications because it's a little too open in my opinion. But I also think the system that we had was a little too restrictive. There weren't enough opportunities. There wasn't enough, like prove yourself over multiple weeks and like really, grind your way in it was kind of like man if you have a really good day you're in and there's something cool about that too so it's like again it's, there's there's pros and cons to all this stuff and it really i don't know it really comes down to like the organizers and what they want to see so it's hard for me to really like have a, a specific say on like what is the best way to do things um i think it's probably some sort of like combination of all the different systems but yeah that was a huge challenge back then is like trying to find a way to balance giving those teams that had been so good for so long, giving them that sort of auto qualification, but we also didn't want a team to be in there that didn't really belong. And that's where the mm -hmm. promotion relegation system came in. And personally, I was a really big fan of that. I thought that added some real cool, interesting twists 
uh, especially when like cloud nine was in there. It was like, what is happening? Right. This is crazy. But it like, it kind of lights a fire under, you know, the asses of the players a little bit, which is, is you need that sometimes. So I don't know. I, I think there's some really cool stuff that can be done with that system, but um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's changed so much since then. So I, I don't even know if it's possible to bring that kind of thing back, but you know, as a fan of that, the way we did things back then, I definitely would love to see that at some point. What was your favorite moment from it then? Oh God, I, I could never boil it down to one single moment, but um, wow, there's okay, so right, many. A couple. There's so many. Yeah. I mean, I definitely would say like uh, Northern gaming winning season three was just un so unexpected, so unheard of. I felt so bad for that team because Maestro wasn't going to be able to like, they had finally gotten there and then he wasn't going to be there because he had stuff going on IRL, but then turbo steps up and the like birth they, of a super sub. Exactly. Mm. The birth of a superstar. And that was such a crazy experience. Um, I definitely remember that definitely season one. Like there's just, it's hard to top season one, especially for those of us that were like around at that time. Again, just everybody getting together, the, sort of like small, you know, arena vibes that we had there. Um, but season four was also so incredible, like having it at the MGM studio. And I mean, it was just, it was the first time that we're like, oh, this is a huge place. And I mean, granted, it's not as big as some of the places we've seen since then, but at the time it was like, yeah. okay, this is, we're big time now. We're talking like Call of Duty levels, like we're pushing up there. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of other moments that I'm I'm forgetting, but yeah, those are some of the ones that kind of stick out to me the most. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about Counter-Strike already, and you've been following that since before 1.6, you said, and you've seen it grow and grow and grow into what it is now. I mean, I've been to a couple of CS majors there, some of the biggest esports events there are on the planet, but Counter-Strike has a couple of years on us, just a couple. Just a few. <laughs> so how do you think Rocket League compares to Counter-Strike? Because it's a younger eSport, but also it's developed in quite a different direction. And, and in what direction do you see Rocket League go from here? Yeah, it's interesting comparing those two, um, because I think Counter-Strike definitely, like there's some similarity in the sense that both developers were kind of hands off for a while letting the community sort of decide things. Um, but at the same time, I think, I think if, if Psyonix had not eventually been acquired by Epic, they might've ended up in a very similar place with the systems that they were bringing together. Um, I know once the Twitch and Psyonix partnership kind of ended and then uh, Corey and, and Scheiss and those guys kind of took over things they were pushing in a direction that was a little bit more similar to what CS and, and Dota has done. Um, but now it's like, yeah, they're the system that, that's in place now definitely feels more like, well, I mean, it feels like Fortnite, which is what makes sense to me because that's what, you know, that's, that's Epic's biggest game. So um, yeah, they, they're, they've definitely gone in very different directions. I think, I mean, CS is not without its issues as well. I mean, there's a lot of people that, um, would prefer it to, to go one way or another. So I, again, I don't think there's any like eSport out there that has it exactly perfect. But I think uh, when looking at Rocket League and, and just the simplicity of the game and how quick the games can be, I think one thing that always seems to be a struggle for organizers is, is that they, they tend to go like the best of three, best of five route, which, I mean, you could see the way I did things back then. Um, and it wasn't just me. It was a whole team that that I worked with. We were very much more in favor of like the best of seven, best of nine. We were even talking best of 11 at some point. Wow. Like I look at something like CS and I feel like when a team wins in CS, like they've truly won, right? They have grinded to get to that spot. In Rocket League, especially in the earlier like qualifier type matches, I mean, a best of three at this point is not much more than a best of one. You, you win two games and you're in. And like, when you're that good, anybody can win. So I just feel like that's that's an area where I would love to see more. I'd just love to see more games is really what it comes down to. Um, and I know some organizers, like shout out to uh, um, PRL back in the day, they were experimenting with like golden goal type stuff and like 10 minute games versus like five minute. Like I, I love that kind of stuff. 
I know the pros probably hate that because they're used to a specific way, but I love the experimentation because I feel like Rocket League is one of those games that it doesn't just have to be the way we've always played it. There's so many things we could do. Um, I've always wished that non-standard maps would become part of the the tradition. Like I'd love for that to be something where like teams have a non-standard map in their back pocket. And like, when you go play against them, you play at their non-standard map, you know, um, stuff like that, I think could be really cool. I know Sionics kind of leaned away from that. They went more the let's make things even across the board, which makes sense to a certain degree. I think, especially in the early days, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping as time goes on that we lean more into the experimentation. I think we're at yeah. a time now where like these players are just, they're pushing to the very tippy top of what you can do in the game. It's, it's time to throw them some curveballs, in my opinion. I, I like the idea of bringing more attention to the grand finals, m- making the, the way a little bit more, because best, you see that in some... Best of three, best of fives. Yeah, of set, something... Best of fives is the way. I mean, there are so many esports where the final Sunday is just the grand finals and a show match. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and that brings so much hype to just that one grand finals, because everyone's there for that match. And you know which teams are going to play. They've been stratting. I mean, I know Rocket League isn't that deep strategy-wise, but maybe that can come too. I feel like the best of three, best of five is, is going to be the, the golden standard. For, yeah. Because you know why? Because best of fives, as Cloud said, are pretty volatile, which means it would probably likely go to a final third set. But at the same time, you still have to win six games to win. Like you have to win six games of Rocket League. Uh, instead so it has that sort of like you have to be the better team over the day but at the same time because of the volatility of best of fives you'd be really it would kind of be like tennis where it's like usually in like uh yeah yeah in the sets like you know the worst player will still probably take a set but the best player usually wins because there are just so many points in the game yeah yeah yeah. and cloudful you've mentioned it twitch hadn't didn't continue running rlcs sailnix basically took over right so how was that for you to have your role being reduced? Yeah, I mean, it was at the time, it was it was definitely frustrating for me. Um, to be fair, I was not, you know, and I, I don't know how much of this I can share. So I'll try to, you know, try not to get myself in trouble. But, you know, the, the agreements between Twitch and Psyonix, those were above my pay grade, <laughs> right? That was like on my side, that was Nick Allen and Justin Delario that was kind of handling that stuff. And then eventually Robin Alleman. Um, who we all went on to do Twitch Rivals afterwards. Um, and then on the psionic side of things, that was like Josh and Luke and, and like Jeremy and, and Dave, uh, who was the CEO at the time. And so like my understanding now looking back is the agreement was that psionics and Twitch were going to work together for a few years and then psionics was going to take it over, which makes sense, right? Psionics is a new company, um, newish company, and they had mostly done like contract work. And so this was like their first big break. And they wanted to focus more on the game and kind of leave the day-to-day organization of the events to a team that had been doing that. And so I had joined what was known as the Twitch esports team, um, which was filled with a bunch of folks from all you know different groups uh, uh, and different games and communities. So we had a lot of collective experience, um, but not specifically on Rocket League. That was more what I was focused on as well as uh, James Villar or James Bot, as y'all know him, uh, who joined me later on. So yeah, at the time it was definitely gutting because like we loved Rocket League and I, I didn't want to stop. Like I wanted to keep doing it. Um, and to be fair, I did have an opportunity to join Psyonix. I ended up choosing to stay at Twitch. You know, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to look back now and say what was best because I ended up getting laid off from Twitch earlier this year. So you never know. Um, and I still have a lot of love for, for Rocket League. I think for me personally, I thought that I was going to still be able to be involved with with Rocket League, even though I was going to stay at Twitch. And I also thought that maybe I would have the opportunity to work on a lot of other games. Because as much as I love Rocket League, I do love a lot of other games too. So I thought there could be a way to, you know, do both. Yeah, James I mean, let it be known that Cloud Fuel once was a Guitar Hero pro. Oh, somebody's done their homework. Wow. <laughs> this That's is true. impressive. This is true. I did. Uh, I did win a competition and got to perform up on stage, which was uh, That's awesome. quite something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so James ended up going with Psionics, which I mean, that was the best move for him. Um, he's, he's killing it over there. Uh, nothing but love for James. So, yeah, it, it kind of split up the dream team, which 
you know, sucked at the time. But like looking back, I think it was probably the right move because I think Psyonix needed to kind of take things in and, and like figure out how they wanted to do things. Um, I'm still a big fan of like Corey um, and Shice and like they brought in Ian and, and some other folks. Uh, Gilly was awesome when they brought her in like that team. It took them a little while to get going, but man, they they were crushing it for a few years there. Um, and of course, it's all changed now. You know, Epic's had some layoffs. I mean, the, the industry, let's be honest, the esports industry has been in a rough shape for the past year or so. So, yeah. you know, n- nobody's been able to kind of skirt around it. Everyone's been affected to a certain degree. But yeah, at the time, it was definitely, you know, a little demoralizing. Um, but I, I got the opportunity to still work within Rocket League to a certain degree with Twitch Rivals, which was awesome. I got to work more with the content creators and like, you know, Hootie, you were in one of the events, you know, you got to see oh, yeah. kind of like the pros and the content creators come together. That was a really cool thing to kind of do. So, yeah. Yeah, we I, I mean, I'll speak for the content creators. We love Twitch Rivals. It's uh, such a cool opportunity to get to compete in a like and obviously uh, it's like a pro am kind of vibe, right? Like you have professionals totally. that are actually good and then you have people that are not the so football good. one uh, the football but one th- those like are so fun term. because you get to compete in, in a you know a semi-competitive environment so you kind of get that that feeling that the pro- professional players get it's definitely a fun thing to be a part of the football one was incredible the yeah football one it was yeah. like genuinely like top five yeah rocket league events i've ever seen it was so ridiculous and it was so entertaining <laughs> yeah it's such a great opportunity mean, that was one of the things we had thought about as well back in the early days of rocket league um esports is we wanted these like i remember talking with uh, my boss about it like we wanted these players to become superstars right we mm-hmm. wanted them to like have the opportunity to get their names and faces out there just like you think about the greats of call of duty league of legends like all of them have you know, somewhat household names at this point, right? We wanted the same sort of thing for Rocket League. And by having, you know, the systems that we had that kind of created this, you know, opportunity for the top teams to continue to stay at the top, it allowed for that to happen. And Twitch Rivals was ended up kind of being a derivative of that, where we focused a little bit more on the content creators. And and it was also meant to be like a system for retired pros, right? Someone like Rizzo, perfect example of like someone who, Played at a very high level, super charismatic, great personality, transitioned very easily into becoming a content creator. And like Twitch Rivals is meant for that sort of, you know, that kind of vibe. So, yeah, Hootie, you're, you're right on. It's meant to be like that pro-am style where really anybody could be involved in it, regardless of your skill level. And it's more about the fun, um, which I know it, it kind of rubs some people in the RL esports scene a wrong way because it's not exactly what they expected. But I, again, I'm a huge fan of like, Rocket League is a game that can be played so many different ways. So I've got nothing but love for folks like Lethemir that like go out there and really try to push the envelope of what can be done. Um, so yeah, I, I I really hope to see more of that stuff in the future. I know that like Epic's got you know the whole Fortnite system with the the UEFN stuff where you can build custom maps and whatnot. I'm really fingers crossed. I know people are a little salty about the rocket racing thing, but fingers crossed that the the hope is that they're doing something where eventually all of Rocket League lives within this whole Fortnite UEFN system. And then folks like Let Mirror could just go crazy and build all the custom maps that we've seen on Steam, but now they're available to everybody. And then all of a sudden the world blows up and Rocket League's bigger than ever. Like that's my dream. So we'll see if it comes true, but that's what I'm hoping out for. Yeah, because right now it's just one French dude, I believe, uh, Ikas, but there was something who has been trying to build his own map creator within yeah, Rocket that. League. That's very cool. It is very cool. But it yeah, cool. it's just one guy trying something. Yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on something that you said really quickly uh, about how it wanted to make these players superstars. It kind of made me think, and I don't know if you or, or Hootie or Jens agrees, but it does kind of feel like the league play kind of figureheads, players, the Garrett G's and Justin's, K-Dops, Turbo's, they're almost deified in a way that the newer players, and maybe it's just because they're newer, but I think of someone outside of like, ah, even so, like players like Zen, Fatira, Atomic. Monkey Moon. They don't, they don't, yeah, Monkey Moon. They don't feel like they have the sort of prestige, that household name factor that I feel like the Squishies and the K-Dops did. Do you think that the open system, while, you know, like you said, it has its pros and cons. Do you think because the open system sort of, exposes the lack of i guess uh 
discretion between the top teams and the bubble teams. So you have things like Carmen Court missing a regional despite being considered like a top two team. Do you think it almost it almost more like makes them seem too mortal? And that's and that, and that reason that's why you don't see as many of these players become like almost like you know gods within the esport. Yeah, I certainly think it's a lot harder for someone to like really stand out now, which to a certain degree makes it even that much more impressive that Zen can do the stuff that he does because like he's doing that despite all the odds, right? But that being said, like he's kind of the rarity, right? Vatira's up there as well, obviously, but like there's there's only a few that people are like, oh yeah, these are the best, right? Because like you said, you've got so many that are in contention that theoretically any given day any of them can make it in and so when you don't have that consistency yeah and like you could argue that okay well what's better for the esport having it to where the teams that are all within like earshot of each other in terms of skill all have a shot at, at competing and any one of them could win so there's that uncertainty there's something to be said about that but then there's also something to be said about the consistency Right. And I think when you look to like pro sports, which we don't necessarily have to mirror that, but that what is that that is what was there before us. So it's the easiest thing to look at when you look at pro sports and the way they do things. And you can even look at like League of Legends um, and other esports that have that sort of league system where people orgs buy in and they they get that continuity. The difference there is like you have names that stay around. And then the change is the new folks coming in, the the folks that are kind of trailing off, they go out, they go to a new team. But when you have completely brand new teams every single time, players changing left and right, it's just really hard from a viewer perspective to get engaged with it. And it also doesn't help when you have so many matches that are happening. It's like, I'll be honest, like I, I've been around Rocket League Esports since day one. It's hard for me to keep up. It's hard for me to keep track of what's going on. And I know if I'm having a hard time, newer players got to be having a real tough time. So, again, there's pros and cons to it. It's, you know, this might be better for some players. It might be better for the TOs, but I don't know if it's better for the viewers. And you've got to find a way to balance all of that. And, again, there's no perfect system, but it's like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's still more to come from Rocket League Esports. I still like – I still think that there's a better way to do things. Um and I know that, you know, Epic has fully taken over at this point, right? They're, they've got a new system in place. They've got Blast Esports running things. Blast is going to have to, you know, kind of figure things out as they go. And it seems like they've, they've, you know, from what I've seen over the past few months, you know, anytime they did something the community didn't like, they instantly changed it, right? They came in, they're like, oh, okay, we'll fix that. So I love seeing that personally as a TO. Like, that's really good. So I, I guess to answer your question, yeah, I, I do think league play makes it a lot easier to have those names become synonymous because you have to have, you know, it's, it's a habit, right? The more you hear somebody's name, the easier it is that, you know, you can just recall that and, and get to recognize them and their skill. The more you see them every Sunday or every Saturday or whatever day the competition is going to be, uh, you know, it, it's just going to make that a lot more likely for, for people to get to know them. Um, that being said, I think there's also a lot of onus on the players and, this was kind of a, a meme back in the day, but like build your brand. It's a huge yeah. thing, right? And it's something that like is still prevalent today. And for whatever reason, you know, in my experience, some players, you know, they, they kind of geared themselves that direction and other players really didn't. They focused more on just straight competing. And I would say that, again, there's got to be a balance between the things, because if you're not out there, if you're not making yourself known, if you're not building your brand, if you're only reliant on your skill in the game and the amount of times that you show up on the big stream, you're limiting your chances to like really make yourself something beyond this. And there's been a lot of incredible players that have come and gone. And if they didn't really make a name for themselves, where are they at now? Right. It's hard to say. So it really comes down to what people want. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think league play makes it easier for those folks that are really, you know, kind of the best of the best or close to the top it makes it a lot easier for them to kind of stand out and, and have consistent opportunities to get themselves in front of the crowd. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think it's, you know, you talk about building your brand, but I think that that is part of building your brand. When I look at the most successful esports organizations within the rocket league ecosystem, they're almost all tied to a single player who, and that players, like I think of NRG with Garrett G Garrett G didn't start like grinding content until COVID, but he was already like a, 
the equivalent of a household name in the game. Same with Justin. He doesn't do YouTube chain apps with G2. I think there's something to be said about when you stay, when you when, as an organization, if you're always in the pro league and you have at least one or two players that are always in there, think about Space Station as well with the players they've had, that helps everybody, right? That helps everybody, like, be, the, you, the, you, the org gains fans, the players gain fans. I think it's important, and I think it's something that we're starting to lose uh, and, you know, maybe is a, a point of concern. The problem is that there's enough players who were really good, like Monkey Moon, who would have had a really tough time getting through RLRS into RLCS. Hmm. Well, it has one, to be some sort of... One of the things that I was going to say, too, is like, you know, we've talked about these different structures and systems that leagues implement. I think you've got to cater it or tailor it to the time, right? Because seasons hmm. one through six, there was not the same level of talent quantity-wise. Right, like it was a smaller pool of players that could actually compete at an RLCS or even basically RLRS the entire level. world was like a minor region right now. Exactly, and now you've got a developed game and esport that has existed for almost a decade at this point. And so maybe, you know, the system that would have been ideal in early seasons is not the ideal system anymore. You know, things change, things grow, and and you got to adjust and adapt as well. I'm not, I don't I don't know exactly what the uh, you know perfect situation is. Um, but I think it's something that is probably not like the NFL has existed for forever and it's got its system and it's going to keep rocking, right? Like we know what it is, but Rocket League has not existed forever and, and it's still experiencing ebbs and flows. And so the, the you know, the structure of the, the professional circuit and the professional league may have to reflect that and, and adjust with the times. I, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I would say, yeah, I definitely agree. It's it's like you couldn't take what we did the first four seasons and just slap it in today and make it work. Right. It wouldn't. It would have to be some sort of amalgamation of what we currently have, what we had before, and figure out the best way to make it work. I do think there is definitely something to be said about having some sort of continuity yeah, at the top. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be league play. I think a couple of years ago they were doing something where there was the auto qualifications and like that helped mm -hmm. to a certain degree. Yeah. I'm also sure. a really big fan of the wild card system. Um, I think that was something that, like, you know, I know they've moved away from it, but I'd love to see that coming back. Um, sort of like last chance qualifier, wild card sort of thing. So I do think there's like, like you said, it's like you could take elements of the yeah, different systems yeah. and make your own new system that's reflective of the time because you're 100% right. Like the players nowadays, like there are players nowadays that don't even come close to touching the, the you know, the top upper echelons but they would dominate anybody from previous eras right right you know it's just like people are so good at this game now mm. like there's I, so I, many yeah and there's so many of them so it's like you you it's really hard to to make a system that works perfectly but i do think yeah you need to have something where there is i don't know make it where it's hard for teams to get in but once they're in there it's hard for them to get out to. Well, even on the flip side of, you know, you're talking about continuity and you brought up names like Rizzo or Jane Apps and Garrett that have been there forever. But you remember the waves that Justin made because it is hard to break into that upper mm -hmm. echelon. And he True. did. And once he did, and he's not alone. I mean, he's an extreme example, but you've got players like Arsenal and Rettles. They still have big brands. And, and you know, part of that is what Cloudfield mentioned where you build that brand and content as well. Um, but they were not, and, and full respect, but they were not, immediate superstars in the same way that Justin was. So they're not that extreme example like a Zen or a Justin or a scrub killer, but they broke through that barrier that we're describing where there's continuity and these new faces pop in there, even Mist or Gyro, you know, um, and they haven't done content to the same degree. So yeah, I, I fully agree. I think there's a balance to be struck that may be missing at the moment where we're, it's so fickle right now. It's so volatile. There's so much change from, I mean, split to split, you know, we had a split, this season, we had a team, Redemption, right? And they, two-thirds of that team, joined one-third of another team under a new roster resolve. It's like, it's just this constantly revolving and changing thing that, and you guys have all said it, it's hard to latch onto and be a fan of a specific team or even a player because here they are bouncing around so frequently. Yeah, I'd like, and I'd love to get your guys' opinion on this. It's something I think about all the time because I want to see the best version of, of Rocket League at an esport and i think you know as cliche as it is because it's car soccer i really do think that mirroring the way that european football is is the way now it would be a massive undertaking and it would it would be a massive investment but 
the idea of having a larger domestic league play expand, let's say 16 teams with a promotion relegation to a second domestic league play on top of a completely open domestic cup. That's maybe doubly limb the whole way through. It's built in game using the club system. Yeah. Come on. That's cool. Well, that's that's too, that makes too much sense, Hootie. Please. Um, <laughs> and then on top of that, I think you can almost like the best teams from those domestic leagues in each region qualify to a sort of touring circuit of international play, somewhat yeah. like a Champions League or yeah. a Europa League. Uh, to me, that feels like a, a like it, like I said, it would be a massive undertaking, and it would require a ton of money, time, and effort. People that it will probably never be done. But to me, that makes the most sense. It, it combines a ton of open competition but when you're at that top and maybe even you give orgs that spot those spots you don't even give the players the spots in that highest level of like international play where you're actually going region to region having lands and then like all that culminates in like some sort of final land um but do you guys ever see you know rocket league sort of expanding to a point where you almost you have multiple s tier competitions throughout the year or do you think that epic is going to like really hone in on making the specific RLCS the like premier competition and we're not going to get any other type of stuff going forward. It's tough to say. Um, I, I love your, your, your thought process there. And it's, it's interesting because like many years ago we did this, this sort of like mock UEFN thing and it was, uh, or not you you, uh, UEFA thing. And, uh, we got the teams to sort of play as the different, uh, teams and it it was really fun and like i always thought that there was something within that doing that sort of like multi-tiered league system i thought was really interesting i'd personally love to see that you know maybe you guys could do it at some point like do it as sort of like a a summer event in between uh the bigger things just to prove you know prove the concept and show what it could be um but to your point about whether or not epic's going to do that i my experience in working with epic and seeing what they've done with uh fortnite they definitely seem to have been of the mindset of like making one top tier system and everything filters into that. And you just have like multiple opportunities to get in. And it's like a cyclical thing. Every three months you go, you start a new season, you rinse, repeat, do it again. Um, That's not to say that they couldn't change, right? They're, they're working with blast esports now. Uh, You know, they had some success at the end of last year with the FNCS invitational, which was a LAN event. I personally am a huge fan of like live events, obviously. And I hope to see, you know, like I've always had a dream that like having a world cup where, you know, you have Fortnite and rocket league together, you have like rocket league taking place inside of Fortnite. Like it's getting there, right? We're getting that place. It's totally possible to make that happen. So I'm hoping that they're open to like making the systems a little bit different, but based on what I've seen so far, I think it's probable that they're going to continue down the road of, pushing everything towards the RLCS. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because they would like to control what they have and that's the way to do that. Um, back to season two, I want, I would like to get your reaction to this, uh, cloud fuel, um, going to bring up some bad memories. Maybe, um, what are your thoughts when I say that 59% is larger than 61%? Not a kid. <laughs> oh, I had man. to do it. I, I thought those days were behind me. Um, I had to do it to you. Yeah, that was that was rough. Um, it really just came down to the rules not being clear enough, and like the intention of the rule versus the rule as it read. And uh, you know. At the time, it was, you know, I was working with um, Mike Brancato, who's now, I think, the VP over at uh, chess.com. And he's, you know, he's somebody that comes from, like, the Smash world. So he's very, like, you know, he's got a very specific system that he likes to use. And, um, yeah, so we had something that was kind of put into place based off of that. And I think we didn't really factor in. I, I think I'm trying to remember back now. It's been a while since I've thought about it. But it was, like, a match win percentage versus, like, uh, something else and, and like yeah so we're talking about the european uh yeah it was like flip side market league. yeah yeah exactly so northern gaming won the regular season by going five and two with uh uh 17 and 10 uh game score and then you had flip side in second and mocket in third 
based on their percentages, 61 and 59%. But initially, Mokit was actually in that second spot and that made a big difference. Yeah. Because the top two immediately went um, into the second stage of the playoffs. Yeah, they had the playoffs. Auto, auto bid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those learning situations where like you try to think about every possible scenario and that one just snuck by us. Like we should have we should have had that figured out. Um, thankfully, you know, the community called us out on it and we were able to resolve it. Uh, it was a rough time. <laughs> That's for sure. And, it, it, you know, looking back. One now, of the wildest 24 hours, it, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. And it, it makes for a funny meme. So, you know, it's it's good to look back and laugh now. But at the time it was I was sweating. That's for sure. <laughs> Right. Well, you have a lot of experience with league play, so I would like to ask you this. What advice could you give us for the Shift Summer League? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, like I said earlier, definitely focus on scheduling, uh, you know, between trying to accommodate the players and, and their availability and whatnot, and also trying to make sure that the you're staging the matches throughout the season based on, you know, what you expect to be sort of marquee matchups. Obviously, things are going to go wrong. Teams are going to do well that you didn't expect. Teams that you did expect are not going to. Like, it's just going to happen. But I think, you know, put a put a little bit of, like, effort into that to try to make sure that every weekend or, you know, every day that you have a match is exciting. There's always one to look forward to, at least. Um, that's going to be like that, oh, that's that marquee matchup. I can't miss that one, you know? Um, I think that's a really right. big thing about league play is, like, having those marquee matchups that everyone sort of pencils in. Um I mean, I remember back in the day when it was like, oh, when's the NRG C9 match, man? I got to make sure I watch that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so stuff like that, I think, is really important. <clears throat> Obviously, rules are really important, as we just discussed. Make sure you've you've thought about every scenario there. Don't make well, mistakes that I we mean, did. <laughs> honestly, you've copied most of the RLCS rules, so it should be good. Yeah, I but, mean, uh, yeah give that a shot. But yeah, we, yeah, have region, yeah. we have region lock, though. Oh, okay. no, no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that. not. No, no, no. That's not going. <laughs> that's not getting past us. <laughs> good, good. But uh, th they should be available on uh, shiftarly.gg/ssl um, for nice everyone plug. who wants to check them out. So yeah, hopefully it'll be a good summer mm -hmm. event, and hopefully we get to do more of them. Hopefully, I'm super excited about it. Um, I. So I am just a Rocket League guy. I always say this. I'm not not really into esports or gaming, which I know makes no sense. But um, I come from the sports world, and I think Rocket League being so sport like just grabbed me, and and you know I fell in love with it. But I want to ask um, because there's a lot of discussion about Rocket League and how can it grow. Um, like Yen's even talked about it earlier, I think relative to some of its esports peers, there is less strategy involved. Um, it's a lot about execution in those within those five minutes. Uh, mechanical execution at that, not just like a game plan. And so one of the things that I'm always curious about for, you know, perspectives uh, from people that are into other esports and other games, um, what what is your take about Rocket League's potential to grow? Um, I think we know that it is kind of a high, hmm, how do I say this? It's obviously easy to understand and pick up the controller and play, but it's very hard to be any good. And, I, and when I say good, I mean, we're, we're talking about like gold level, right? Like just basic mastery of movement in the car. Because I can remember, I had to play with car cam because when I would go to ball cam, right? And the ball was behind me, right and left was inverted. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I couldn't do that. My brain couldn't do it. So. Rocket League has a, a relatively high barrier of entry skill-wise. Um, and then obviously the skill ceiling is con like it's, it's still going up. So it's got its strengths, but I also think simultaneously those things are kind of weaknesses. There are so many people that I've talked to that's like, I tried it and it was way too hard. I did not have fun. You know, it took me, it's going to take me forever to get good at this it game. It probably took me 100 hours to actually Absolutely. hit the ball consistently. Absolutely. So anyways, I'm rambling here, but my, my point is Rocket League, is so unique it's hard but simple it has no direct peers you know you've got like valorant apex call of duty and i know that they've all got their own flavor but it's still a first person shooter um and rocket league doesn't have kind of i guess cousins or something whatever so what, what do you think 
or what is your take about Rocket League and its potential for growth? Or, or if you have any suggestions, what, what do you think Rocket League could do to help aid its growth? Yeah, those are all really good points. And like, those are things that we thought of very early on. Yeah. I remember having a lot of conversations about like, you know, like you just said, it's like that, that low barrier to entry. I mean, it's gotten harder now, right. Than it sure. was back then, but at the right. time it was a low barrier to entry to like be able to get in and play the game, but it was really hard to get good at it. Like you said, but on the, on the flip side of it, it's really easy to watch and understand what's going on. Right. I think rocket league has done a great job over the years in terms of making it visually appealing. We really struggled in the early days of like, we had to have like observers and, the auto cam was a whole thing, you know, all of that's kind of in the past. And now we have some systems that work. We've got observers and things that, that make it look really, really good. Um, but in terms of like similarities, you know, we've always thought that the closest thing was actually the FGC um, yeah. because yeah, fighting it's, games. it's a fighting game, right? So it's like, it's simple to understand one person wins, the other person loses. Yeah. You don't necessarily know all the combos that go into it and all the complexity behind it, but you understand the concept and it's really easy to watch. It's all kind of contained in a single frame. Um, so that was kind of the similarity that we thought of. And when I look at the FGC and the way they've kind of progressed, and obviously there's a lot of different games within that, I look at Rocket League kind of in a similar way where like, you know, the community has been what has really championed the the progress of this game. And that's not to say that, you know, we haven't had support from Twitch and Sionics and Epic along the way, but we got that support because the community demanded it. The community proved that there was a hunger for it. And I think that has to continue. I think I would love to see, and I'm, I'm so excited to see what you guys are doing this summer. Um, I would love to see more of the community supported events. That was something that, I mean, as somebody who came from the community, I love seeing TOs get the opportunity to work with the developers and work with like, you know, the folks that are running the big scene to make things happen because, I mean, that's how I got started. And I know that, you know, as a fellow TO, like we have the potential to do some really awesome things. We just need the opportunity. So I love seeing that kind of stuff. I think that's really good, not only for giving sort of undiscovered um uh, players a chance to sort of like prove themselves but also undiscovered talent casters tos whatever right it's it's everything um so i definitely want to see more of that kind of stuff but if i'm being honest that's that stuff is going to be great for like the inner sort of community i don't know that it's necessarily going to push the envelope in terms of where rocket league goes so right. to answer that question and it's a tough one um i think that the, the stuff that i would like to see rocket league do is more collaborations with prominent figures out there in the in the world whether it be sports celebrity whatever um there was a little bit of that a few years back and it kind of went away but it's like it's one of those games that like everybody can play everybody mm -hmm. understands what they're getting into you know and it's it's fun and it's different like you said there's no it's not like cs and valorant that are competing head to head it's not you know warzone apex PUBG all competing head to head there's only one rocket league there's nothing else like it not even sports games, right? Those are all very different. So I don't know. There's just something really iconic about what Rocket League is. It, it marries the sort of soccer experience, the sports element with the racing. You know, it brings all that together. And so I don't know. I would just love to see more of that kind of stuff where it it leans into those kind of celebrity uh, yeah. opportunities. And I know they've done a little bit of that over the years. And I, I just want to see more of that. I also think more opportunities for – and this is something I was working on when I was at Twitch, more pro-am type stuff. Like the pro stuff is awesome. Don't get me wrong. People love the pro stuff. But pros are not always on the same level of celebrities in terms of fandom. And I think yeah. that's something that I wish had been done better over the years. I look at someone like a John Sandman who's been there since the beginning. And I'm like, how does my dude not have a flag in the game? Like, right. Right. Like he's been killing it for so long and like he's gotten to a point now where it's it's hard for him to like have the same level of interest that he once had because yeah. there's not a lot of like community fun stuff to do. And so I really want to see, you know, this is this is a plea to Epic. Like I see the stuff they're doing with Fortnite. I want to see that stuff come yeah. to, to Rocket League. Give us the opportunity. Give the, the Lethemirs of the world the opportunity to go out there and create really cool, fun stuff that allows people to just be playing the game all the time. 
Like people live on Fortnite. Like my kids, one of my my youngest kid plays Fortnite all the time. He lives yeah. on Fortnite, right? It because it's it's, it's a social hub at this point. I want to see yeah. the same sort of thing for Rocket League. I want to be able to like go in there, play a, a, a traditional game of Rocket League, go do something else that's Rocket League esque. Like I want to be able to yeah. just do all that stuff together. Mm-hmm. And I think like that's gonna bring that's gonna bring that level of like you talked about the the barrier. It's gonna bring it down a little bit because now all of a sudden it's not just hop into a, a casual, which let's be honest, it ain't that casual anymore, or a competitive match, right? And, and get get my ass handed to me by some really good players. No, I can hop in with people that are just kind of goofing around having a fun yeah. time. Yeah. I remember back when I was playing, we would do we would come up with the wackiest games. We had like uh, box golf where like you would have the square cube ball and you'd like made it to where like the floor was lava and you you couldn't let the ball touch the floor. And like we just made up our own games. We would play we take the double goal map and like each player had to control one goal, one side of the goal. And if, if you got scored on, you lost a point. Like we would just make up stupid stuff like that, but it was so much fun. And like, I mean, I think like, you know, Shogun and, and Johnny boy, they did a lot of this kind of show matchy silly game type stuff as well. Uh, Gibbs has like his whole Gibbs uh, show thing, like that kind of stuff. I want to see more of that to where it's not up to us to our use our imagination, but we can actually work, within yeah. the system to make these things a reality because then all of a sudden it's like you're you're taking the the concepts of like a a mario party and you're adding that in so it's it brings down the the skill barrier for people that want to just get in and have a good time yeah. but then guess what as they're playing they're unknowingly getting that's right that's right. as they get good they rank you know they, they rise up the ranks and they get yeah. to the pro level so i want to see more of that kind of stuff yeah. for the bottom end and then for the top end I don't know. I just want to see some more consistency. I think, you know, Yenji had some really good points about the league play stuff. I want to see, I want to see some posterized people. Like I loved how big, you know, KDOP was like on top of the world mm. for so long. Turbo was on top of the world. I want to see more of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I think the best way to do that is to, to have that continuity. I, again, I know it's, it's a hot topic, but finding a way to marry the systems in a way that gives up and coming teams the opportunity to get in. But once they're in, they're in for a while and they don't just instantly come back out. They have to, they got to prove themselves worthy to get in, but they also have to be proven worthy to be knocked out. Like find some way to make that happen. There it is. Psionics take notes. There we go. Get to work. <laughs> Cloud fuel said it. So <laughs> can't get it from a higher authority. All right. That was my questions. I don't know. About you guys. No, I got my only question out. Yeah, uh, Thank you very much for joining us, mm-hmm. guys. Hugo. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank it you. was a pleasure. Likewise. Okay, we're back from our serious segment talking with Cloud Fuel, and now we are going to mix things up a little bit, and I'm just going to pass it right over to Michael, take the reins, and let him know what we're doing. So, you know, for the next two months, three months, we're going to be talking about only a few teams, right? But the Rocket League ecosystem is more than just the teams that make the major, more than make the world. In like fact, it. we would not have <laughs> an, an RLCS or RL Esports without the hundreds of other teams that compete. And we felt that it was important to do a special sort of half episode dedicated to those teams. And we're going to call it the Cancun Awards. Now, why is it called the Cancun Awards? You ask. What does that mean? Non-American, uh, North Americans. Well, there's a saying that once a team is eliminated in a, in a sport, whether it's you know basketball, football, uh, hockey, well, they get to take their trip to Cancun to go golfing, sit on the beach, and uh, you know rehab after a long, grueling season. About 98% of Rocket League pro teams are now in Cancun. In fact, we've actually gotten word, and I won't say who it is, that one of the teams that was supposed to be, that was asked to play in the qualifier for the Shift Summer League will not be competing because two of their players are literally on vacation. Thankfully, we don't forget those people. And so we're going to talk about and celebrate all the incredible stories, players, and teams that made this le- this year so special, even with all the noise surrounding it, because even though they're in Cancun, they're still also in our hearts. That's so right. let's kick it off. That's beautiful. A really easy one. I have, actually, well said, my Michael. geography, I think, is pretty good, but I actually don't know where Cancun is. Mexico. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's like a so it's, it's like on the beach. A very well-known holiday destination yes. in. Oh, it yeah. is. Uh, it's like it's like you know. Ibiza. It's our Ibiza. Yeah, it's like right. It's like Ibiza. Okay, for sure. 
uh, or like, you know, other places, like the south right. of France. The Ibiza Awards. I can get behind yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Right? You go there, you party a little bit, have a little cocktail. A little bit. Sit on the beach, you know? Just a little bit. Nice. Exactly. Get, a, get some very um, in the moment tattoos. Yeah, dude, totally. Ooh, I, I like that. Time. That's, that's um, what Ibiza is known for as well. That's right yeah. up my alley. Very irresponsible tattoo. That's ideas. perfect. More irresponsible, the better. Looks like that's where Hoodie's headed after he goes and falls exactly. oxygen into the major for a bit. <laughs> we got one arm done. Let's throw the other. We need some more over here. But yeah, so let's start it off. And we're going to talk about, I want to go around, similar to what we did with the major. We're just going to have a little round table on a bunch mm-hmm. of uh, topics. Okay. Which team that's in Cancun right now did you enjoy? Which team are you going to miss watching the most? Mm. Maybe not the best team, you think. Sure. But the team that you were you know, excited to watch. So Hoodie, why don't you start? Uh, Well... Ironically, the snowmen are in Cancun. Oh, no. They're going to be melting. I know I had a ton of fun with these guys. Y'all, I'm sure if you've been watching the show, you have picked up on the trend. I love watching upcoming talent blossom into the Monkey Moons, the K-Dops, the, the Garrett G's, the Justins. It's so much fun to see these new guys um, march their way onto the scene. And, I mean, Scribbles, you know, if we hadn't had a rule change, he still wouldn't be competing. So, to see him get that chance uh, prior to turning 15 was super fun. I think those guys, they showed their potential. They showed, um, you know, glimpses of what they could become as individuals or as a full squad, uh, especially in the latter half of the season, you know, that event where they uh, beat Gen G in the Swiss stage and then played them competitively in that top eight uh, area as well. It was a, a ton of fun to watch the snowmen this season. I've got a team. Mm. that has actually done something that we've been talking about all season and that Mm -hmm. is play spoiler yeah because so often we're kind of looking at teams can they play spoiler can they knock out a team that may be above their pay grade and sir actually did it so if we're talking about a team that you enjoyed watching maybe not for certain fans but for the entertainment of the esports, then Su should be up there. Because they're the team to actually play spoiler where nobody else could. Yeah, I mean, broke, broke all broke the championship Sunday streak, made Carmen Corp miss the regional. They were the boogeyman. They were the I boogeyman of those open. You guys, this hat is annoying. I just want to <laughs> want you to admire it's my a duck. duck hat. Yeah, see? And then and that's the yeah, end I'll of take that. It off. Um all right. so so for me. I actually changed it last minute because I originally had Shopify Rebellion. As you guys know, oh. I was riding with the Rebels all season. Yeah. But on my drive home today from my from my nine to five job that you know I love so much, mm-hmm. um, I I had to change the heart because I didn't. I you know there were large swaths this season where I didn't enjoy watching Shopify play because I knew they could do better, sure. and it made me sad to see them not perform to expectation. So I changed it because there was one team that just put a smile on my face every single time I watched them, and that was Team Solo Mid, TSM. These these three players, man, we didn't like they they had some some great results in the offseason. People thought they'd be a main event team, but they made some runs and they beat some teams. And the way they did it, they just seemed like they were having a blast with each other. They were having a blast on the field. They were just happy to play the game. And in a in a year that's been defined by a sort of cautious skepticism around the future of the esport it felt like the tsm players had just discovered what the rlcs was and they were in like their honeymoon phase of the esport um i i i think wavy is uh a mm. uh, what's a bubbling star i guess is the word i'm thinking uh, a burgeoning burgeoning star that's the word i'm looking for i thought creams really came into his own i think hockey was a solid piece that really allowed him to play that very team-based style and whether they compete together or they split up i will be following all these players and I will be really, in, I'll be invested in their success going forward because they just made me enjoy watching it. I mean, I think you know what they have? M80, they that? have joyous whimsy. That's they what they do have. have <laughs> some joyous whimsy. They had power. The power of friendship was on their side mm. right up until they missed that last regional. I mean, I Wavy's just there. a great kid. He shared yeah. his yeah. Spanish presentation on and so, Twitter, and it's just amazing. Well, to me. Um, TSM, what they personified was sort of the idea that you don't have to be a big name or have crazy wild mechanics. You can just care about playing with your team and, and get 
uh, you know, really good results doing so. I think about that series against M80, which really felt like a complete clashing of styles. You had this team that had heavy expectations, had been put together by the org with this idea of we're going to put you all together because you have this massive amount of talent and we're going to figure it out, right? They weren't like, it wasn't like they were like friends before or like really good friends before. They weren't teaming before. It was like, we're going to throw it together. And it was very serious. We have to do well because we've been put together to do well. And they struggled with that all season, especially in those quarterfinal matches. But then you got TSM, three players yeah. who love being around each other, who came together because they enjoy each other's company. And then what happens? They beat M80, right? It's it, that literal, like, joyous whimsy seemed to come out on top in those final moments when one team was frazzled, the other team was laughing and, and smiling and mewing on camera. And to me, that's why TSM was just the most, the most fun I had watching uh, a non-Worlds team all season. But yeah, now moving on. Let's talk about teams you thought didn't think they'd be booking a flight this early this season. Mm. There were a lot of teams that came in with heavy expectation. We talked about M80. Which team were you most surprised to see on the beach with a virgin strawberry daiquiri currently? Uh, well, let's go. Let's let uh, Jens go first, and then we can. Okay. 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 Tag team. Um, I went with Luminosity Gaming. For me, they were the third best team in NA in the first split. They were in points, I believe, but also mm -hmm. like they literally were. They were that third best team. You could you could say that Space Station uh, was shooting for that third position as well. But I was expecting them to at least keep a third to fourth spot going into the second split as well. And, and to see them not in that conversation, to see them not, you know, making uh, making it to Worlds, that that's something I, I did not see coming. I, I have always ranked them higher than OG, and they just fell short, in my opinion, there. Cody, what about you? Um, are you? You're not changing anything, are you? No, no. Okay. That's, that was my only change. Okay, well, then you and I have the same... And it's ninjas in pajamas. It's um, a very good choice. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the big thing for me was once they got that regional win, mm -hmm. you know, I just totally. didn't see, I didn't see how things could crumble. You know, I think um, the big thing that I was not anticipating was Furia not rebounding in this third regional, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just saw how dominant Furia had been all season and then, Ninja's finally able to take them down and a huge victory over complexity as well on their way. Uh, and I think one more team actually in the semifinal. I can't remember who it was. Uh, but yeah, after after that performance, I just thought Secret, maybe? It may have been Secret. I think it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, after that performance, I thought, you know, one of two things is gonna happen. Either they're gonna play well enough that they'll be fine, or Fury's gonna win the event and it's not gonna matter and they'll have enough points. So yeah. I just, you know, I didn't I didn't even consider uh, the possibility of of them. At, at the very least, not being at the major. Totally. I think uh, with the talent they had, especially with the hype coming in around Swift, uh, and Astromic yeah. always kind of finds a way to like make a couple lands every year, it seems. I was expecting them to make it, especially like you said, after they won that regional, it felt like mm -hmm. a turning point for them. They couldn't figure it out. I would have loved to see them. I love, like, I'm the same with Hootie. I love seeing like new, new faces pop up and, and make a name for themselves at these international events. But you know what? Fair play to Team Secret. I thought they they really yeah. showed that they were the second best team in Sam, especially in the back half of the second split. Yeah. And uh, you know now, you know Ninja Pajamas they get to go on vacation, so mm -hmm. everyone wins really. Well, <laughs> uh, I don't know if they feel the same way. We may not we may not ask them about that. And not just the teams, but <laughs> you know which young players that were missing out on every land mm. have impressed you the most. Well, I know my answer. Mm -hmm. And it's right in line with what you just were saying about Ninja and Pajamas there. It's Swift from that team, which I believe has slotted in so well into that roster. And you could argue for him being the best player on the squad. So I think it's really a sign of greatness from such a young player that he instantly knew how to play with his team and he was not the question mark for his team 
at any yeah. particular event. Yeah. Right. And that's what you want to see out of this young talent. And that's why he impressed me so much, even though he missed out on every LAN. Yeah. I, I'd like to see, I think Swift is, is, po- is kind of positive himself to have a really strong 2025. Like, I think he's got all his experience and his first thing he's, he's, he's reached the summit in his rookie year, winning a regional. And I would personally, I'm rooting for him and Diaz to link up. I know there's been a lot of competition between the two, but I'd love to see the two young stars of Sam link up together and, and, and make some noise in that region. For me, I'm actually going to reverse yet and talk about a, a selection of his from earlier on in the Cancun Awards. I'm going to go with Tekos because Tekos won against Vatira a million times. And, you know, some people have alleged certain hater allegations against me, which I neither confirm nor deny. I'm <laughs> pleading the fifth on that one. But, I mean, listen, as a young player, the scariest thing is established players, right? We saw it for years in our conversation with CloudFuel. We talk about how a lot of those top players would be able to sit in the highest level of, of, of league play because the other players would kind of poop their pants playing against them. So to be so fearless to constantly go up against these legends of the modern era and come out on top is so impressive. And uh, similar to Swift, I think he's positioned himself in a really good spot for next year. And I'm excited to see what he does with his, with Su or whatever other team he joins going forward. And, and my choice uh, for young player that impressed me is Wavy. We've talked about TSM and We're just how, much fun, uh, how much fun those guys are to watch. Wavy is just a, you know, he, he is a, an outgoing personality. Michael mentioned it earlier. He's on the camera. Uh, you know, viewing, whatever. <laughs> This is all I'm, I'm, I'm aging out of this, so I don't know what all these things mean anymore. But, uh, you know, just just seeing somebody have fun and I mean, it's his rookie season. You know, this is the first time playing in RLCS and being so comfortable. And, and I had the, the opportunity to um, interview the TSM team. Go watch it right, on where my can YouTube we channel. See that? Go Anywhere watch it on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe. H-O-O-D-Y-H-O-O-O on YouTube. Thank you. Um, they talked about he was actually their last like on their list of people to try out, he was their last um, like candidate. And they said like immediately they clicked because he was so hungry to learn. He was so humble and just wanted, he just really wanted to be the best player that he could be and find the most success that he could have and, and threw out all ego, threw out all pride. And I think that's apparent in all the $20 1v1 tournaments he plays. You know, he does <laughs> not skip any opportunity to A, win some money, but no matter the amount. But B, hone his skills, hone his skills, hone his craft. So a ton of respect for Wavy and, and those players that grind like that. Um, I do want to also give a shout to his teammate Creams. I thought Creams, he's not as young, and he's obviously been around for a while in the sub role, but he was freaking phenomenal. I thought he was so, so good all season. Those couple of really good events that TSM had, I think was a lot to do with Creams playing uh, some of his best ball. Sure. So big shout to Creams as well. Yeah. More honorable mention I, there. But I like um, to hear that he's just playing in everyone's tournament like that. But I know. you know what they say, <laughs> 20 bucks is 20 bucks. That's right. Yeah. I think it'll be exciting to see what happens with Wavy Creams going forward, mm-hmm. whether they stay or split. Because I think specifically with Wavy, I think there's a lot of other young players who could use someone like him around where they kind of struggle with mental stuff. He seems to have gotten sure. that down. Well, I'm yeah. sure he has his issues with the yeah, yeah. and whatever, but... He's a lot farther along, it seems like, than a lot of other players. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of reminds me of when Arsenal first came in. I know he's had some issues, you know, reported issues with mental stuff, especially later in his career. But early on, he was just known as that kid who was just bring up uh, bringing energy, such a positive, having some fun, yeah, exactly. And, yep. and it obviously has, you know, for a long time, kept him at the top of the region. Yeah, it's worked out. Shout out to all three. Yeah. Yep. Um. So this next one is actually unanimous. unanimous yeah. Term, what the sigma? Um. <laughs> so we're gonna talk. I guess we'll just talk about it. Uh, the the team. If we had a, like an LCQ for the last world spot, the last which chance team do we think would win and get to the world championship? Who wants to say it? One, three, two, oh. one. Luna, Luna Galaxy. Galaxy. Oh, we're so good at that. <laughs> we think so that that's amazing. Time. That would be <laughs> better. Obvious. They they look like a top team in Europe. Yeah, absolutely. If you're a top team in Europe. You're probably a top team in the world. Yeah. Um, just a question though. If they were playing at this major, what would your expectation be for the, their finish? Can I, can I give like a, a range? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so round five of Swiss to top four. Yeah, I there. was going to say top eight. I think they're a top yeah. eight team. I think yeah. they run into a I don't know a if they would Falcons though. G two right there. Yeah, exactly. I would I would give them round five to be honest, but I'm yeah, a pessimist, I guess. Yeah, well, it, it's yes. it's tough though because they just hit their stride, right? And and yeah. so you don't want to overvalue yeah. it, but at the same time, yeah. a lot of these lands they they 
you know, it favors those teams that are hot right now. Right. So. Yeah, that so, is. That I is think true. they they remind me a lot of in terms of their positioning worldwide. I think they're they're firmly in that SSG category where sure. it's like it would be a huge success to get top four. But I think they'd be a little a little disappointed if they didn't make it to the top. I mean, it would be I'm, completely on brand for Tox to miss out on the playoffs <laughs> just by like one goal. It sure yeah. would. Man. OT game five Jeez. against Power or something. I mean, it's um, already inc- incredible that just after uh, Finn wrote an entire article for Shift yeah. about Tox always just missing out mm-hmm. on LAN. There he, he is he again. Out by one spot. Missing out just, on LAN by one so spot. He's so on brand. Talk about building your brand. Consistency, yeah. man. Brand. Yeah. Got it. Um, so another question, which team hmm. in Cancun currently, you know, maybe, again, so. maybe, maybe doing some salsa, salsa classes. I don't know. Which team do you think should run it back for 2025? Oh, the team that's absolutely getting the name of their ex tattooed on their legs <laughs> right this moment. <laughs> that is jobless. That's jobless a segment. Segway in. <laughs> Jobless are a team that are partying in Ibiza right now, but they should be back on the grind right at the start of next season because I think even without any star potential, you could say, uh, they are strong enough to get picked up by an org and to do really well. You know, I think they, they have, have really underrated still. year. Yeah, like, they did. As, 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 as much as they missed a regional, and that's what's kind of defined it, but like, Two top eights, two top fours. Most teams are yeah. walking away from that pretty happy. Well, three top eights, sorry. Three top eights, two top fours. If that other regional, they don't miss it, they go top four again. Like, right. we're talking about them as like really uh, having and a strong it, it year would in have been, loaded world. Yeah, it would have been different if they hit a bit of a slump right next, uh, right at the end of the season, but they didn't. Yeah. yeah. Um. So for me... I told you I swapped my first one, and then I said I wasn't going to swap anymore, but I lied. I'm going to swap again. I'm actually swapping it right in, and I want to go with Shopify Rebellion. So I, I put TSM where I was going to put Shopify Rebellion. I put oh, Shopify Rebellion. run it back, Rebellion. Um, in a similar vein to what Hootie talked about, I think they finished the season so yeah. strong. Yeah. Um, I think they, they played a very risky style. They were the top offense in North America, and they were the worst defense in North America among qualified North American teams uh, in the main event which means that they like to, you know, full glass cannon it. And uh, I think a lot of that came down to, and I, I mentioned this in our last kind of talk about Shopify, but that Parth said they weren't necessarily putting in the work they should have. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're playing a really balls to the wall style, that could kill yeah. you if you're not on your game, right? Yep. But I think towards the end of the year, I've said it multiple times, I think Two Piece looked as good as any player in North America. I think oh, yeah. he was up there with Beast Mode, LJ Daniel, uh, for the best player in the region. I think Parth, who is historically been quite inconsistent started stringing together consistent performances and you really saw it i was also going to point out that two piece was actually the best performing player in north america statistically this split thanks to shift stats um and justin was where, third. where can you find those stats you can find them on shift and also on our twitter account which is you know we have about okay. seventy thousand followers you should follow it too it's what all the cool kids are doing um justin was actually third as well so they were absolutely frying teams yeah. scoring wise uh and i think listen if you told me that there was a team that went 3-0 in North America and finished top two, I'd tell you that's a contender. Um, and, you know, things can happen over the offseason. But to me, I look at that team as a team that was finally starting to piece together their identity. And unfortunately, we just have a shorter season this it, year. I think they would have been fantastic. In the it's season. very similar to what you guys just said about Jobless. The one missed a regional. Exactly. And it really, yeah. really put a damper on the full season. Well, they finished, I think, seven points out of a world spot, and yeah. they finished top 16, one regional, and missed another one. If they get yep. two it's, top eights, we may be talking about them as a team look, that OG has look, to pass. That, exactly, because that top 16 is not good. Mm-hmm. But you can flub like that. You just yeah. can't miss a regional. You cannot miss yeah. a regional. Totally. We're seeing Carmi Court so, face. Almost like there should be a little bit more safety and consistency <laughs> in our lcs format you said it not me you said it, not <laughs> hey me. this is a fun we're gonna get to the we, oh, we already right. had our we're, we're, segment. we're on holiday so that's right yeah, we're, we're on, vacation, on holiday dude. Dude. Get, get a drink in your hand <laughs> yeah no um but yeah i think justin still has a lot in the tank yep um <laughs> i really think that there's a there's a lot of alpha 54 to him where he was playing sure. with players that were past their prime and it kind of hit his results and he but became easier. a little underrated um and then now that he's playing with maybe two younger stars uh, and players that are developing, I think I think he's still got a lot in the tank. 
And I just really believe in two piece, man. I just want to see two piece yeah, get to that land and perform. Well, well mine. We're talking. Yeah, go for it. My uh, my selection for the team that I would like to see running back. No surprise, Snowman. And let, let me give you the reasoning, because obviously I, I, I've been a fan of the younger upcoming, the budding talent. But I think um, that's not really a part of why I said it here. Why I said it here is because I think that is one of the teams that has room to grow from what I've seen. I think mm -hmm. a lot of the other rosters, M80, they're all very talented, but it, it just feels like, unfortunately, whether it's mental or not, like they've hit their ceiling. Um, you mm -hmm. know, I, I think TSM... Fantastic players. I mean, I've, we've already shouted them out. I, I love these guys, but I don't, I don't see them excelling. I can see Snowman with that same roster that we've seen now mm -hmm. have a, a hardworking offseason and be a top-four team next season. I could see that. I could see them being at every single major. I think they have more to give um, or more to learn, I guess, and, and experience to gather and even more confidence to, to build as they roll into next season. And you look at the ability mechanically, I mean, they're all three more than capable. So. Um, you know, my, my perspective there with that team is they've got plenty of room to grow their first season under their belt. And I think uh, throughout, like I said, a hardworking offseason, I, I could definitely see them solidifying themselves as a third, a fourth team in North America. Well, let's talk about our Cancun or Ibiza MVP. Okay. Maybe, and, maybe before we go, I want to do a yeah. quick shout out. I would like to see the boys down in the Middle East, Team Rock. Yeah. You guys need to stay yeah. together too. Because yep. I think you yep. can echo exactly what you exactly. said. I almost about said that. Yes. Team Rock. So, yeah, 100%. Just, yeah. Same thing for them. It's basically the same team, just a different region. Yeah. <laughs> it really is, dude. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we're talking about our MVPs mm -hmm. on the summer break, then I am struggling to piece together why I'm the Don't only you... one picking. My boy, two piece over here. <laughs> when you were just hyping up here. the entire team <laughs> and he's, telling he's, me he's ascending. There's someone else who's at the top right now. Telling me player who can how he's plans. the best statistical player. What's this all about? Well, For me, the MVP is two piece because I believe that even though he had very decent teammates this season, the points didn't really reflect how good two piece is. Okay. I think. Him individually as a player uh, is ranked below where yeah. his skill can take him. So for me, out of the players, not making worlds is my MVP. Yeah, I think there's a lot of oxygen LJ to him where it's like he's going to move yeah. to, if he moves to a team with other top teammates, you're going to be like, wait, is he the best player in the region? Right, that's what I'm no. getting at. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm going to go with the player who I feel like already showed that he's a top player and unfortunately was born in the wrong country, so he doesn't get to team with the top players. Uh, Hootie, I believe this is your selection as well, and that is Mr. LTK Atomic from Luna Galaxy. This guy has had an absolute tragedy of a career. Um, you know, he, Bro, he won a regional when they, during COVID, so he wasn't able to go to the land then. Finally gets back to that top area, gets the team with a former major MVP in Mark Baez as well as Dorito, goes to the land, Beats phase and then throws two series. That was a really tough one to watch. Mm. Uh, and he's really struggled to get back there. But I think all season, there's never been a doubt about Atomic. I mean, he is an absolute stud on the stat sheet. And if you watch <laughs> him, like, it's hard to believe that this guy's not consistently going deep at lands. Yeah. I think he's one of the best players in the, in the world. And I think if he decides, and I don't know anything, so don't get mad at me, but if he decides to move regions, it would be completely justified because he's kind of getting hard capped by French people right now. And if he moved, decides to move to another region and farm that region, I will not be surprised. Wait, I was I was trying to figure out a way that we could work in Atomic and make fun of Yens, but I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't come up with anything. I like it. Unfortunately, two piece is just the I, that our social oh, media manager. I was just, well. okay. This is what I had him. All I was stuck with was like your joke was an Atomic stinker. <laughs> yeah, right, that was pretty yeah. good. You, you've no, got nuclear um, on that one. <laughs> Our, our social media manager at Shift, Will, has this one meme he loves to use where it's just a picture of two piece and it goes, it just says, struggling two piece together, how you've just lost the Shopify rebellion. <laughs> Great stuff. It is um, a very good meme. That was good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that wraps, does that wrap the Cancun Awards? Absolutely. But that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, listen, to, literally, genuinely to every team, your season, your RLCS season is over. You can obviously still compete in other tournaments, such as the Shift Summer League, which we'll get Ooh. to in a moment. 
But thank you so much mm -hmm. for working as hard as you do, for grinding scrims and VOD replays and playing those god-awful open qualifiers where you have to play 1700s for no reason, uh, and, and making the RLCS season what it is. Because without the players that are currently laid up on a beach chair, listen to the ocean breeze, we wouldn't have stories like Su. We wouldn't have stories like the Snowmen. We wouldn't have stories like Team Rock. Even stories like Erase, you know, going on these miracle runs in the final ones. And uh, you make the RLCS what it is. So never forget that. And keep on your grind because your time's coming. Wow, we flew through that. Just like how we should be flying to Ibiza right now. Dude, I'm in the mood, man. <laughs> put this <laughs> and if you do it, if you do it proper yeah. European style, you go on a very relaxing holiday to sit all day by the pool at the hotel. But you get up at 5 or 6 a.m. to put your towel on those chairs so you can <laughs> so you claim can them claim for when you, go, when you wake back up at like 9 or 10. That feels like Bali to me. It's, it's a German kind of stereotype, but it, it applies to most of Europe. That's awesome. <laughs> All Good right, planning, well, let's move on. Let's, go, let's keep it the summer theme, though. Yeah. Because we, have a, we had a big announcement go up for the shift team. We are, we are saving the off season. We have decided to take the, you know, we are shift already keeps the off season interesting with roster moves, but we decided to take it a step further and introduce the shift summer league, bringing back league play. And I'm going to hand it over to Jens, who's taking a huge role in this talk, some information about it. If you didn't know anything else about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you should be on shift RLA.gt right now to read all about it. Um, we've got an announcement post as well as all the info you might need, whether you're going to enjoy watching the games or try to qualify to participate in them. It's all there. We've got the rules as well on shiftrlyg slash SSL. Because of course we had to be funny and make the abbreviation shift summer league the same as supersonic legend. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's our first attempt at organizing a tournament and what I can say is that if we can make it a success, we hope to do it another time. Hopefully uh, make it not just a, a one-off for us. Um, but yeah, it's it's a great honor to be able to present uh, an off-season tournament from a, a third-party organizer, which we haven't really seen, uh, I think, with, uh, with all the top teams there uh, in, in quite a while. So it's lovely to actually bring some contact, content in between uh, quite a large gap between the RSS Major 2 in London and the World Championships in Fort Worth, Dallas. So we're kind of trying to fill, fill up some of that space there. And we're doing it with a league play format, which we haven't seen in RSS for several years. And um, yeah, which is, it it's, won't be exactly the same as RSS. Um, it will also only be North America and Europe, but again, if we can do it another time, hopefully we can run it back even bigger. But for now it's Europe, North America, no weird system where you can play from Sydney or wherever. Um, we're just going to do it the way RLCS was going before it turned into an open system. Uh, with a open qualifier, a play-in, where you will see some of the top teams that are outside of the top six as well, basically a close qualifier, if you will, uh, into three weeks of league play, mm. ending it at the start of August with some playoffs where the top six teams from the 10 teams participating in the league per region, obviously, get into a playoff bracket where they're competing for $20,000 per region. So 40, 40K in total. Um, sponsored by Sailnix. Big shout out to them. Obviously, with a prize pool this large, you'd have to get, that's the rules, you have to get approval from Sailnix to run this kind of event. Uh, we did. They've been very helpful in supporting us to get this off the ground. Um, so yeah, shout out to them. It's not all doom and gloom in 2024. Love it. Um, yeah, I mean, the top teams, you know, no leaks, but it, it does it does seem like just based off public 
interest. We had G2 Sathew showing showing some love in the replies. Uh, Rettles hopped in the shift cord, which you can obviously join in the link in our description, to ask our founder, Achilles, if he would be invited. <laughs> and he <laughs> is, in fact, invited. That's um, one way to do it. Yeah. And so it seems like a lot of the, I mean, Oski, I believe, retweet, retweeted it as well. So, you know, tons of the top players already kind of staking their claim that they will be there. Uh, really, really exciting to see going forward. But there is another off-season tournament. Well, not really off-season, but a third-party tournament going on really, really soon. I actually have to see the exact date. But Johnny Boy, Mr. Showbatch himself, uh, will be hosting a 2v2 major with many of the major teams, as well as a few not. One big thing, G2, which currently holds the best 2v2 team in the world based on the last tournament that had 2v2 in it, Beast Mode Daniel, not competing. Um, but... I want to talk to you guys quickly. Who do you guys think is the favorite here? I'm going to read off the teams that are you don't going have to be. To. Okay. Well, it's I won't. Falcons. It's Falcons. You got yep. it already. That's what it is. Um, I mean, that's fair. I, I, I can't, I can't think, but I think there's some other teams. Like I'm looking at just Drawly exotic Drawly in the two V two tournament. Mm? Mm-hmm. I'm looking at FK and chronic, a little North American fun, maybe taking the, taking a page out of, uh, of the book. Of course, we don't know who the two players for Fury will be. I, I would assume it's Lost and Yan. And, you know, the South Americans, man, they get down in 2v2. Yeah, yeah they do. Um, they do. And I think another team that we got to look at is M80. I mean, you know, hopefully they don't go top eight again. But Nas and Joris um, are going to be, you know, they're two players who have, have been sort of non-three, <laughs> non-standard mode eight. demons. Yeah, that would be really They go top eight in twos as well, man. That's organization crazy. Itself. Yeah. Well, I'm actually hoping they don't go too far because I'd really feel bad for AJ if they, like, win the whole thing. That'd be bad for his brand. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, we also have some uh, expansion region talk. I was talking about Fury and Falcons, but uh, the Gladiators have have put their hat in the, in the mix. We'll be seeing some APAC action. Um, we'll also be seeing Power and Chiefs, Hunter and Finn already. And... Uh, Team that we mentioned earlier, Luna Galaxy. Yep, Luna Galaxy. Who I think is playing under Magnifico. Maybe some. Well, it's uh... just Atomic. He's playing with Rixie. Oh, okay. So gotcha. We'll see what happens there. And uh, so, yeah, there's a ton of massive ones. Batira and Atau will get some action this weekend. We know they're not playing in the major. Uh, we might. They might not even play at Worlds. So this might be the last time we get to see them play. You can't. Hey, can't um, can't forget Twisted Minds either. They've been just that sleeper that yeah. I think myself included. Uh, you know, everybody's overlooking and. They, well, it's um, fun too, they actually right? just had they they concluded the Saudi E League, and mm-hmm. Falcons went through uppers, and Twisted Minds actually took the first best of seven, so pushed them to that second series. Now Falcons did win the event, but um, yeah. Twisted Minds is right there, man. They're balling out. Yeah, so it, it's going to be exciting. The teams that aren't at the major that will be competing are Magnifico or Atomic and Rixie. Um, Resolve is playing. Raziers and Ivan will be will be there. M80, as we mentioned before, and Jobless, Ixo and Oli. So maybe Yen's dream of them sticking mm-hmm. will continue because, I mean, at least two-thirds. So, yeah. you know, we can't hold out there. But, yeah, so super exciting stuff. I, I can't wait to watch. I love yeah. some 2v2 action. Hope we get another sort of universal open thing uh, in, oh, in, man, in, in the coming off season because 2v2, while it's maybe the least interesting competitive mode to watch, it's such a nice, like, change of pace in the same way that ones are. Absolutely. While we're and, on and the topic if they of get a 2v2, one tournaments, then AJ can win it. <laughs> yeah, while we're on the topic of 2v2, I will also be hosting a couple 2v2 tournaments this uh, offseason as well. I don't have dates and stuff for it. It's definitely going to be after, um, it'll be after London and maybe, maybe closer to Worlds. I know there's a lot going on here with Shift League and uh, Summer League and, and these other things. So we'll see. But I, I'm, if you will, stay tuned because I got... Uh, and Hootie, where will we stay tuned? We're going to stay tuned on the, the Twitter is where I'm going to announce everything. Follow me there, Hootie Who, uh, H-O-O-D-Y-H-O-O-O. It's the same across all platforms, and Twitch is where everything's going to be broadcasted. Awesome. It's great to see some of these gaps being filled up by yeah. third party. I mean, it's, it's awesome to be a part of that as mm-hmm. well. I mean, for us, it came together uh, with the uh, partnership, if you will, uh, with Quick Fix Media which is launched by Oxygen Esports. So uh, now we're part of the same team, Hoodie. Woo! And, and I'll be, I can... I'll be rooting for you. I'll be rooting for Oxygen. Play that. We're actually working in esports. It's great to be able to say that out yeah. loud and not have people ask questions that you can't actually answer because nothing has been made <laughs> official yet. So finally out there. It's all great. Very exciting stuff. We do have a long off season, but a lot of the community is stepping up. If we flash back to what Cloud Fuel is saying, 
It's on display right now. The community is is passionate and they're doing what they can to provide content, provide opportunities for the players to play. We're going to move to our final segment, our recurring segment, speed taking. Let's just jump right into it. We got uh, a, a, a take here from uh, Methelion? Methelion? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. That works. Sure. Okay. Yeah. They say 1v1 skill is an overrated metric in evaluating how good an up-and-coming player will be at 3v3. Who are you throwing this team? Do I want it? I'll take it. Michael? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I think we, we, uh, we stick so much. Hold on. We stick so much right on the out. success stories that we don't think about the failures. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There have been a ton of players who have been who have made noise in ones and never done anything in threes. Um, well, but the ones who hit really do hit, and they all yeah. play a similar style. Um, that's sort of I, I, I kind of call it the typical build, which is the counterattacking hyper mechanical third man. Um, something that I don't think Sip gets enough credit for. I don't think Sip gets enough credit in general. But um, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of players who never do anything with their one skill. And it's because kind of what we talked about with Wavy, you have to be willing to learn. I think a lot yeah. of players get really good at ones and just assume that's going to be what makes them good. But you have to be committed to m learning threes and then applying the skill, the individual skill that you can accumulate really quickly through ones. I think about Daniel and how he's really struggled, it seemed like, on his first split on B1 with consistency. Because he came into Space Station, they built a system around him that allowed him to enable enabled him to play very much like a ones player, right? They had two player players kind of running point, getting demos, stealing boost, and the job was to get the ball with Daniel to Daniel in the air with boost because that is a one style of play. Once he went to G2, he really committed to learning how to play the threes, and look, he hasn't finished worse than second since then, right? So, well, I think you know the Zens and the Daniels and the Rawasses are, are fantastic. I think there's a lot of players who don't make it through one, so I would I would tend to agree. Yeah, I think uh, that Diaz, Diaz, Diaz was hyped up a little bit too much because of that. Because everyone yeah. saw him in the 1v1 just before he joined Complexity. And yeah, it's a, it's a tough transition sometimes. It's a, it's a layer of our obsession over mechanics, which obviously yeah. is important, but it's not the only thing that's important. Booty. Yes, sir. Yan's struggle in last season, 2020, 2022-2023, takes him out of the talk for goat expansion region player so non-nau player i don't think so i think it obviously devalued the stock but and, and and so like if we're exclusively talking about sam then absolutely not if we're talking about every region outside of na and eu then i would still say no um i think he is in that discussion i think there's only a few players in that discussion uh realistically i mean you've got trk ahmad Khaled, probably the yeah, twins those, at this point, and yeah. definitely will be in that discussion moving forward. And then from Sam, I think maybe King Card, Raise Bull, Raise Bull. Um, and then so yeah. I think he's still in that discussion, yeah. but uh, it's, I mean, I definitely understand what they're saying. It certainly devalued the stock. I think he was charting towards being yeah, the agreed, like iconic yep. non NAU player. And agreed. then after the world championship, and then it kind of like the, the, the momentum slowed down quite. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Uh, Jens. Yeah. Uh, Dreamhack Montreal is the greatest or most, it was the best LAN in RL Esports history. Oof. Um, I mean, I was watching that too and enjoying the hell out of it. But I don't think you could say that a non RLCS LAN was the best LAN. I mean, if you would just give it to the most entertaining land, then I might even say Beyond the Summit is up there. Yeah. Um, in terms of storylines, Montreal was amazing, but it doesn't top the RLCS lands like Season 5, London. Uh, season 8. It's like Season mm. 8, Madrid. I think even, I mean, it's tough to put season one there just because the, the scale wasn't there yet, but it's, a, it it's an incredible story. And then I think you can look at I personally think LA, London. LA was awesome. At London 2.0 and Boston are like the like S tier. 
like that the Boston thing with with BDS smoke and vitality and then coming all the way back and just like the ascension of of Zen and like that's yeah yeah man that was some good Rocket League being played like for sure I listen I'm not saying it to say it but Carmen Corp blew that lead in Game Seven in terms of inv- individual teams the Peeps run in Montreal was incredibly special. Mm-hmm. So there we have a different conversation. But in terms of the entire LAN, I mean, it was all about the peeps, sure. But it's not above the RCS LANs like Season 5, like Season 8 for me. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, Michael, back to you. This is from Colt. Oxygen have a better chance of going 3-0 and in London than Falcons. I really, I forgot this was take this here, and I was really hoping I could give it to you. No. Falcons are the best what? team right now. What? I'm kidding. <laughs> Falcons are the best team right now. Yeah, I would have said no as well. I think Oxygen are a great call for like a sneaky 3-0. Yeah, sure. They come on and just, just just hit people in the face a few times. I got hit in the face yesterday. You can see a little cut here. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, definitely, um, I'm definitely aware of what happens when you get hit in the face. You get disoriented and you don't know what's going on. Um, but yeah, to me, Falcons... They have the juice to like rebound when they're down two one in a series. They have the juice to rebound when they're down when they're up two one in a series. They can step on your neck like they're just. I think they're the best team in the world right now. I've said it, um, so I, I'd still put them as a three zero favorite. All right, let me bounce one over to Hootie, and we'll finish off at the end. Hootie entering the major team secret should be considered the best team from South America. And who's that from? That is from. Thank you for reminding me. That's we got to name drop that. That's a terrible take. <laughs> Speak on it. Uh, that's that's from Pyro. And look, no no disrespect to Team Secret, but I, I, I mean, I know Furia stumbled a bit, and Team Secret has been consistent, but Furia is the only team that has the ceiling from South America to win an event, and I think that's true regarding the other teams at home. Ninjas, crew, complexity. I don't think any of those teams have the ceiling to truly win an event. And maybe, maybe Fury doesn't either. But they certainly are the only team that has a claim to that. And I think the only team that has shown that kind of level uh, in the past or, or in recent times here, like with their 3-0 run in the recent major uh, through Swiss stage, of course. So, no, I, I definitely would not consider Team Secret to be the best South America team um, at this major. All right, Jens, finishing it off with you. I agree, by the way. Uh, Rettles and Magic Bear. This is our government-mandated Luminosity Gaming speed take. Uh, <laughs> Rettles and Magic Bear splitting up would be mutually beneficial to both players. Um, I would say that's, that's more clear if they had actually flopped this season or this split even. They were still pretty good. Um, so... I think they could do better still. So I'm going to say, yeah, I think Rettles and Magic Bear have stick together for quite a while. It's not a matter of not trying, right? We have some teams where you see players split up or duo split up before they've really shown all of their potential. At least it seems that way, right? And maybe that's due to personal issues, whatever it might be. For Rettles and Magic Bear, they really like playing with each other. It's very clear. And of course, that is helpful in the game as well, right? We've talked about mentality. If you have a good chemistry there, then it doesn't even so much matter that you're friends. It matters more that you have the composure on the field to always be you know, ready for each other's goals, ready for each other's passes, and they clearly have that. Um, but sometimes, you know, you have to make a change if you want to actually improve. And I think Rattles and Magic Bear might actually both benefit from trying something new there. Yeah, just quickly, what you said is true. But at the same time, we now have two full seasons of tape, and their ceiling seems to be top 11, top 12 at a major. And I don't know if, as a competitor, you would want to stick with that and, and, and think, hey, like, we can do better. But at what point do you say, like, we've just hit the best we can be? Like, was last split the best we can be? Was Optic Spring split the best we can be? 
And I think at that point, it's not even like a matter of, I think I can do better. It's just, Hey, we've hit our ceiling as a duo. Let's, let's, let's figure it out uh, outside of it. And if we can't find anything better, let's just stay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's always tough, of course, because as long as things aren't disastrous and you still enjoy playing with each other, then it makes sense for them to stick yeah. right yeah. For, from, from their perspective. But looking at, looking from the outside is what we're doing. Yeah. It seems that they might actually benefit and, and from getting some more freedom to choose some teammates. Yeah. And with this, with, um, with this extended offseason, I mean, everything's going to be shuffling. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't think any player should be held down to uh, their team. And honestly, I thought about this for a while. If I'm sticking with my team, no contact for three months. Don't even hit me up to play other games. I need to come back into the season yeah, feeling like sure. I got a fresh new team. Yeah. Like no, like just no contact. I don't want to scrim. No I don't want to talk. You're blocked. Yeah. I would block my teammates. I'd be like, <laughs> I'll see you in November when we start scrimming serious <laughs> games. Like I'm playing, I'm playing other offseason tournaments with other players on pickup squads instead. Because I want to come back feeling like, oh, this is a new team. I'll tell like you if, what. If, I'm doing it, that's if any of these top level pros need an offseason teammate, I'll fill the void. I'll slide in. <laughs> Who do you say for you? I'm there. Top 128. I'm just saying. Yeah, listen. Proven qualifier demon. Pl <laughs> honestly, proven RLCS riser. Because I bet you most people didn't hey, think that Hootie could make it. All I'm saying is, I've been to one land. And I won the land undefeated. Listen. I don't think there's any, Matt, I don't hey, think there's any other lie. player that's done that. People lie. Oh, Zen. People no, he lie. Hasn't. No, he hasn't. Oh, he lost flip and spin. That's right. It's, and he lost a recent major. A, yeah, that's oh, also a that, that one doesn't count. Then less than Hootie. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Listen, people lie, but numbers don't. That's right. <laughs> undefeated, <laughs> untied. Just like, just like Bill Murray in Space Jam. He's retired, <laughs> undefeated, un untied. Um, but yeah, that concludes speed taking. That was actually a a very fast. Can speed we play a game? Taking. What's up? What's up? All right. What's the game? Here's a game. Okay. All three of us have glasses on. What we're going to do is we're going to either open or close our eyes. You have to guess what the other two have. And you okay. all play along. Y'all can drop your comments. Okay. Okay, so here, here, make your decision. You can either leave them open or you can close them right now. Okay. And then I'm, uh, we'll, we'll go in a circle here. I'll go first. You guys go second. Michael, go third. We'll, we'll say what we think the other two have. All right? Yeah. Three seconds here. Three, two, one, open or closed. All right, I'll go first. I think Yin's... I think they're both open. Damn. Wait, what? <laughs> That's I mean, why I go now. I think I got Yen's right. <laughs> you weren't supposed to spoil yeah. it, but. Yeah. Um, do I go next? Okay, well, let's, let's, well, let's restart. Okay. I'll, I'll re-roll. Okay, okay. Re-roll, okay. re re-roll. All right. Um, open or close? Nobody give any. We're, we're all three. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I'll, okay. Until we, we have full guest. Okay, okay. Three, Get two, now. one. I'll go again. Now I think they're both closed. Okay, uh, I'll go. I think Hootie's closed and Yen's is open. I think Hootie's open, Michael is closed. Okay. Reveal in three, two, one. <laughs> uh, my eyes are closed. <laughs> it. I went over. You guys went over two on me. I'm so good at this. You were right, Michael. Yeah. Or at least on, I on me. Ball, dude. I know ball. I don't know. I Yen's, I were, you, were your eyes open? Well. My eyes were one, open. I went two and up. You guys. I mean, Michael's a champion. And, I think you went one. Sheesh. Yeah. Okay. It's where's, my, where's my trophy? Well done, Michael. We might need to make this a recurring segment since Michael always has the glasses on. Yeah, you guys. Can see if we guess can guess at the end of the show. Day. See what. Uh, see what he's got. Maybe, oh, you before. know what? <laughs> You start throwing in some curveballs, close one. Yeah, I was say one eye. Close <laughs> <laughs> well, the left eye. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Thank you all for watching. That is the conclusion of episode 20, Shiftcast. Can y'all believe it? 20 episodes. Man. Unbelievable. Flew by, dude. Almost half a year. I know. I know. We've been cooking. We appreciate y'all watching. Appreciate supporting y'all. Be sure to share it with some of your friends if you enjoy the show. We'll be back uh, potentially. No, not next week, huh? Because a uh, week after next week, yes, week. next week, yeah, next week, and week after, not maybe not. 
Next oh, no, week maybe is major ne week. No, ne next week might be might be an issue. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Next yeah. week I will be doing a solo shift cast, everybody. Just <laughs> me may... and Lando, and we're gonna talk <laughs> about everything. We may have we may have some solo episodes or some uh, you know duo. Maybe we'll, we'll see what's going on. We've got I'm traveling to London. I know Yans is traveling. Michael's gonna hold it down over here in North America. I never leave NA, man. I'll never leave NA. I'll never leave. But y'all stay tuned. We've got plenty of stuff coming. Obviously, after the majors over, we got a lot to talk about. So stay tuned. We got more. Yip Yap coming your way. Thank you for watching. We'll catch you next time.